good afternoon, good day, wherever you are. So in this video, I will be talking about the 16th topic in the CHAMP syllabus. And that would, that would be symbiotic interactions of plants and animals. All right, so in the syllabus, there are three key things you should understand under this topic. And that is um, food chain, food web, and trophic levels, energy flow in the ecosystem, and nutrient cycling in nature. If you take a look at the jam syllabus over here, you will see that um, the, um, the topic requires you to understand the food chain, the food well, and trophic levels. Yeah, you should be able to interpret the ecological pyramid of numbers and biomass and energy, and also energy flow in the ecosystem. That means you should be able to describe the different circles, and um, you should be able to um, also describe the significance including the balance of atmospheric oxygen and carbon dioxide then in the in terms of nutrient cycling in nature we are looking at three key um, cycles that's the carbon cycle water cycle and um, nitrogen cycle permit me to backtrack a little and the topic itself the key topic which we're looking at actually deals with um, symbiotic interactions and by that you should understand symbiosis Parasitism, saprophytism, commensalism, mutualism, amensalism, and all of these different interactions in nature. All right, I go back to um, the book of which we have been using for this teaching, Explicit Biology. This is uh, chapter 16 and is the 16th topic in the JAMS syllabus. So, a bit, I would not like um, what I've been doing for a couple of lectures now, I would be using the past questions and answers to teach through the entire topic. Okay, so, but a quick overview, a quick overview. Um, when you talk about symbiotic interactions of plant and animal, the key interactions are symbiosis, commensalism, parasitism here, parasitism, and then you have predation. I'll quickly show you a table that explains what all that is. You have mutualism. In, in this case, you have both organisms, organism A and organism B gets to benefit from the interaction or the relationship. Then you have parasitism, where one organism benefits, and that is the parasite, and the other organism is harmed, and that is the host. Then for commensalism, you have um, one organism benefits, and that is the commensal, and then you have another organism not being affected by that relationship, and that is the host as well. This is another way to interpret this relationship. Um, because in mutualism, both um, organisms benefit, right? Um, it can be described using this sign, positive, positive. Both organisms benefit. In commensalism, you have positive and zero because one gets a benefit while the other is not affected. All right? And um, for parasitism, it's positive and negative because one gets a benefit why the other doesn't benefit at all. So take note of that. That's another way to interpret what uh, this uh, relationship or interaction could be. Now, having said that, we go back to, we come back here and then talk about food chain, food webs and trophic levels. You know what the food chain is? That's a linear relationship. And then you talk about food web where you have a complex feeding relationship. And then you talk about trophic levels that, that refers to the step in the transfer of energy, all right? And if you look at that, there are four important levels in the food chain. You have what is called the producer. These are the organisms that convert some of the energy from the sun into stored chemical energy. Usually they are the plants because they can manufacture food using um, energy from the sun. And then once they manufacture the food, you have the first organisms that feed on these producers and they are the primary consumers. And the organisms that feed on those primary consumers then become the secondary consumers. And then it goes up to the decomposers. These are organisms um, that form the very end of the, the food chain. For example, bacteria and fungi. And they obtain their own energy by breaking down dead and decaying, um, or dead and decaying organisms. So that is... Um, the summary about um, food chain, food web, and trophic levels. Then, in terms of energy flow in the system, we can have 
um, we can have pyramid of number, we can have um, the pyramid of biomass. Now, in terms of pyramid of numbers, that's the simplest way to, il to illustrate the feeding relationship within the community. In pyramid of number, you have the producer at the lowest level, and they are usually more compared to the primary consumers. And again, the primary consumers are usually more compared to the secondary consumer. In some other rest scenarios, you can have the producers being fewer than the primary consumer, but this is in very rare scenarios. And you have the consumer also, of course, I mean, the secondary consumer being fewer than the primary consumer. But in terms of pyramid of biomass, that indicates the feeding relationship between organisms occupying different trophic levels with reference to their biomass. So biomass has to do with the mass of the organism or the weights that, that can be measured either taking um, measurement of the, the wet mass or the dry mass of the, of the organism. So you can have all of this um, illustration to explain what um, the pyramid of number is about. All right, so, but let's dive into nutrient cycling in nature. Um, number one, you have the carbon cycle. Of course, plants get their carbon from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Why animals obtain carbon through feeding on plants? So carbon dioxide is added to the atmosphere either by respiration, when you breathe out carbon dioxide, or by combustion, or by decay, or by volcanic eruption. But one major means of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is by the process of photosynthesis. By the process of photosynthesis. Okay, now if you take a look at this um, diagram or this figure, you can see that carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere through combustion, through decay, through respiration, through respiration as well in plant, and it's taking up from the atmosphere by one process called photosynthesis so when you look at these nutrient cycles it's just for you to be able to tell what exactly is going on what direction is this nutrient being circled recycled okay so as the name implies a circle nothing is going nothing is um is leaving the circle in in, in the actual sense of it so the nutrient remains within the the earth so that's the old idea of nutrient cycle. If you consider another cycle, which is called the hydrological cycle, which is the the cycle of water, how water moves from the land to the sea and the air, you also agree that um, some processes releases water into the atmosphere, while some other processes takes um, water from the atmosphere. So, what are the processes that release water into the, the atmosphere? Just pay attention to the arrowhead that, for example, respiration in both plant and animal releases water into the atmosphere. Also, evaporation and precipitation releases water into the atmosphere. However, ingestion can absorb water from animals and then into the into water surface. And from this water surface as well, evaporation can also release water into the atmosphere. Okay, and um, you have Absorption by the root of plant, all right? Absorption by the root of plant is another means of um, water being taken from the earth and then into the plant and then is released into the atmosphere. The whole idea, again, is a circle. What, I mean, water goes out from the earth into the atmosphere and again from the atmosphere back into the earth. And then the most important, yes, for the exam, is the nitrogen cycle. That involves a complex biochemical transformation, which adds and removes nitrogen and its compound from the soil. So you have two key processes that, that are involved in the nitrogen cycle. You have nitrification and you have denitrification. So for the nitrification, that's the process that adds nitrogen to the soil. And there are a couple of them. You have nitrifying bacteria, for example, nitrosomonas, and nitrobacter. They convert ammonia into nitrite. I'm gonna show you um I'm gonna show you probably 
the graph that would explain that. But in terms of um, nitrifying bacteria, you can have nitrogen fixation also by a direct process. In that case, when lightning occurs, nitrogen can be fixed in that process from the atmosphere into the plant. Okay, I'll show you it. Um, okay, now this is a typical figure explaining nitrogen cycle. And what do you have here? This entire process. You have nitrogen fixation by bacteria. Now these bacteria are symbiotic bacteria. They are in the root nodules of this plant and they take up nutrients while they're doing that. And they also make nitrogen available to this plant in the process of um, getting nitrogen directly from the atmosphere. So that is one way. Another way is um, nitrogen fixation by nitrification. Now this nitrification is also a process that is carried out by bacteria. What happens here is that they convert ammonia into nitrite, which is NO2 minus. And then the same nitrification goes on to convert this nitrite into nitrate. So it is in this form of nitrate that ammonia can be made available into the um, can be absorbed by the plant. So when you have nitrate, then the plant roots absorb it by the process of assimilation. So nitrogen from the soil is absorbed by the plant and animal bodies by this process of assimilation. Then there's another process called ammonification. And this is done by decomposers. So what happens here is that they convert dead organic nitrogen of plants or animals back into ammonia. So and that is what is going on here. So you have that same ammonia being converted into nitrite and again by bacteria, then again into nitrate. And that is also made available into, I mean, that makes nitrogen available into the plant. So you can see the entire process that it's, it's circular. And um, before I, okay, there is also the process of, um, there's also the process of um, denitrification. So this removes nitrogen from the from the earth so and that takes nitrogen back into the atmosphere the nitrification so it's a circle and i want you to understand well, what is important in this um, nitrogen circle first the bacteria is involved at different steps or at different um, phases bacteria play a very key role in this nitrogen cycle and they are performed by Two different groups of bacteria you have the symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria which are in the root nodules for example you have the rhizobium which keeps a close association with the host leguminous plant and you also have the free living um bacteria they are non-symbiotic for example you have the azotobata so both this group of bacteria use specific enzymes to complete the biological nitrogen fixation process so you should know the bacteria is involved in this process. That is very key in understanding nitrogen cycle. So if you do that, you are good. And I think with that, the topic is uh, it would have been well covered. I explained in that diagram is also here. Now let's move to questions. I hope I didn't spend too much time explaining. Question number one. Question number one. Question number one, in which of these associations is much harm done to one of the partners? And that would be what? Paracitizen. Straightforward. Question number two, an organism X lives entirely on the waste product in another organism Y. In this association, X is a symbiont, B is commensal, C is saprophyte, D parasite, D epiphyte. The answer to this question is C. It's a saprophyte. Saprophyte feed on dead and decaying organic matter. So Y is a substrate in this case. Question number three. Which of the following is not 
true of symbiosis. A. Symbionts must be living. B. It is an association of give and take. C. The association may, may involve two plants. D. Association between two similar species. And E. Symbionts derive mutual benefit. Okay, question number three. Which of them is not true? If you look at all these options, the option that is not true here is D. It says association between two similar species. Most of the time, um, in symbiosis, the, the organisms involved are unrelated. So D is not true. Question four. Epiphyte growing on the branches of trees provide an example of the relationship known as parasitism, commensalism, saprophytism, olophytism. This is an example of commensalism. So, um, epiphyte derive only support from the host without causing any damage. Question five, which of the following relationship involve only one organism? Only one organism. So you have saprophytism, commensalism, parasitism, symbiosis. If you look at all of this, only saprophytism involve one organism. Like I mentioned in question two, I said, why is a substrate? It's not actually a living organism. Most of the time, it's not a living organism. So the same applies to this question. So in saprophytism, only one only one organism is involved. Why the other thing is a substrate, a dead and decaying um, organism? It's no longer alive. Or a dead and decaying matter. The question five is A. Question number six. Leaching is an example of. So what is a leaching? A leaching is a symbiotic association between algae and fungi. So it's a symbiotic association between algae and fungi. B is the answer. Question seven. Nitrogen fixing microorganisms in leguminous plants live symbiotically in live symbiotically in the root nodules a in the root nodule of leguminous plant don't forget question number eight mycorrhiza is an association between fungi and the roots of higher plant a why mycorrhiza is a symbiotic association between fungi and root of higher plant so the fungi aid the root in the transport of inorganic nutrients from the soil into the plant. Why the plant supplies? Why the plant supplies um, the fungi with organic nutrients? So that's what happens in mycorrhiza. Question number. Question number. Number ten. Are we on number ten? Yeah, number nine. Which of the following is an example of parasitism? A. Fungi growing on a dead tree branch. B. A squirrel living in, a, in an abandoned nest of a bird. Mistletoe growing on an orange tree. And D. Cattle egret taking tick from the body of cattle. Parasitism causes damage to harm one organism while the other benefits. So what do you think will be the right answer in question number nine? It is C, mistletoe growing in an orange tree. Mistletoe is a partial plant parasite. It is parasitic due to its possession of a modified root called Osteria, which is used to obtain organic nutrients when it pierces the old stems. So itself, it's an autotrophic plant because it has green leaves. It can carry out photosynthesis. But what? It, it, so it, that's why I said it's a partial um, parasite. It's a partial parasite. Question number 10. Which of the following association is an example of mutualism? Which of the following association is an example of mutualism? You have Hydra viridis and Zoop chlorelli. You have human and lice. You have shark and remora fish. You have bread and rhizopod stonifers. So in mutualism, what's the key word? Both organisms benefit. It's a win-win, right? So what happens in Hydra viridis and um, Zuclorelli? So in Hydra, Hydra viridis have Zuclorelli algae cells. 
in their bodies. This algae photosynthesize and produces sugar and other things, which are both used by the algae and the hydra. Now, the hydra also supplies the algae with its mineral requirement. So, in this case, the hydra vividis and the zooclorelli are in a mutualistic um, relationship. If you consider other options, like option B, this is a parasitic relationship. Option C is um, a commensal relationship. The shark doesn't get any harm. It doesn't get any benefit either with the remoral fish. Why, in the case of this, this is a typical example of saprophytic uh, relationship. So the right answer is option A. Question 11, the association between bacteria residing in the cecum and of the ruminant, all right? The association between bacteria residing in the cecum of the ruminant is an example of mutualism again. And why is that so? Bacteria in the cecum of ruminant help to produce cellulose for the digestion of cellulose. And you know, most of the, the diet of the ruminant is heavily laced with cellulose. So when they digest this, they produce vitamin B and vitamin K. The bacteria in turn will then gain shelter and protection. And of, of course, it also gets the ideal environment. Question number 12. Mycorrhiza promote plant growth by we mentioned that earlier. We mentioned that earlier. We said um, mycorrhiza is a symbiotic association between fungi and root of higher plants. Okay, so um, the right answer to this question would be D, absorbing inorganic ion from the soil. Question number 13. Now, this is, this, the following set of questions will be questions on food chain, food web, and trophic levels. We've just covered questions that are related to um, symbiotic interactions. Question 13. A food chain always begins with the producer. The pro always begin with the producer. So the right answer to that question is B. So food chain must begin with an autotroph. Question 14. You have this food chain, grasses, grasshopper, lizard, snake, and ox. In the above food chain, the organisms which are the least in number. If you remember, a typical food chain would have the, the, the producers being the largest in terms of numbers, in, in terms of pyramid of numbers, and the consumer the last consumer in the chain would be the least in terms of number. So if you go by that logic, the question says in the above food chain, the organism with the least in number would be the ox. Is that right? What are the options? The grasses, grasshopper, lizard, snake, ox, and that would be option E. Question 15. Which of these is not true? Grasses in the above food chain will number one trap all the sun energy, trap a small amount, a percentage of sun energy. All primary producers are eaten by primary consumers. Well, which of the following is not true? Number one, we know that which of the following is not true about grasses? Grasses in this um, food chain are producers. They are producers and they are eaten by consumers. So C, D, they're right. Now they trap a small percentage of the sun energy. And option A says they trap all the sun energy. Well, A will not be right. So the right answer would be A because it is not right. And why, what is the reason? Only a fraction of solar energy that reaches the Earth's surface is absorbed by plants, not all the solar energy. Not all the solar energy. Question number 16. It says, choose the sequence which represents the correct or the correct order of organism in a food chain. Now, if you watch out for all of these options, they are tricky because 
they begin with grass they all begin with grass which is the producer they all end with orc which is the um the final consumer in this case but in between let's see what would directly feed on grass grass to snake this is wrong grass to grasshopper is right grass to grasshopper is right so the answer is between b and and c so when grass upper feeds on grass what feeds on grass upper is it toad is it snake is it toad then snake will feed on the toad and then orc will feed on the snake the right answer then is option option b option b now the next one the next question question 17 in a community in a community bacteria and fungi are referred to as decomposers the right answer is b question 18 which organism is an omnivore what's other omnivores they can feed on both plants and on animals you have praying mantis, orc, you have mouse, you have grass upper. Grass upper feeds on grass. Mouse will feed on both plants and animal substance, most likely. So mouse is an omnivore. Mouse is an omnivore. The right answer is C. Question 19. Which of the organisms will have the lowest population in an ecosystem? Remember that. Um, the number of individual organisms decrease progressively down the trophic levels in the food chain that is from the producer to the consumer so if you have a question which says which of the following will have the lowest population in the ecosystem then you have to check it out what position does that organism occupy in the ecosystem if you if you check in these options among the options provided here in question 19 this is uh, occupying the highest position and therefore it will be it will be the lowest in population the right answer is a question 20 organisms in an ecosystem are usually grouped according to their trophic levels as they are usually grouped as producers and consumers every other option disregard the right answer is c question 21 at which trophic level would the highest accumulation of non-biodegradable substance occur at which level are you going to find the highest number of non-biodegradable and that will be at the tertiary level why so um the concentration of non-biodegradable substance will increase as, as it goes higher up the food chain for example ddt in um aquatic body or if you have ddt which is a poison or a pollutant in, in the water um fish which occupies the second trophic level will carry some amount now when you see uh, the seagull that, that would then feed on them would take in more of this compared to um, the fish. So at the tertiary consumer level, the amount of number of degradable substances will be highest. Question number 22, which of the following set is made up of decomposers? Let's see what we've got in the options. What are decomposers? Mushroom rhizopause bacteria the right answer is b question 23 in a food chain each succeeding level in a forward direction represents if you're moving in forward direction what does it represent in a food chain so as we move forward in the food chain there's a decrease in number of individuals we mentioned that earlier okay and that is option b that is the right answer now we are going to look at questions around energy flow in the ecosystem and the very first question will be question 24 the highest percentage of energy in an ecosystem occurs at the level of the highest energy will occur at the level of the producer remember c question 25 a, pyra a pyramid of number can be defined as the number of individuals at each trophic level of a food chain at a particular time and what option represent that definition numerical relationship of a food chain c question 26 the unidirectional flow of energy in an ecosystem is known as 
the pyramid of energy or energy pyramid question 27 in an ecosystem the least efficient transfer link is from the least efficient transfer link in an ecosystem it says um, producer to primary consumer this there will be high amount of uh, energy here sun to producer yes there's a, a very high amount here the, the highest will be sun to producer uh followed by producer to consumer so the highest will be p followed by a then primary consumer to secondary consumer yes this will also that will be followed by this so and for d secondary consumer to the composer the energy here would have been drastically reduced so the least energy would be at that point question 28 in a typical predator food chain involving secondary and tertiary consumers organisms become progressively organisms become progressively larger and fewer along the chain now let us see what we've got smaller and more numerous no equal in number and size no larger and fewer along the chain c larger and fewer along the chain now take a look at this pyramid you have e for algae f for tadpole g for tilapia h for shark which energy i mean sorry which level of the pyramid has the least total stored energy which level has the least total stored energy now if this represents a pyramid you can you can understand that the size what you have here algae to tadpole the algae here will be green algae so these are the this is the producer this is the primary consumer this is the secondary consumer and this is um, a tertiary i would say a tertiary consumer that will feed on the tilapia but remember as you move up the pyramid what happens the energy reduces so the least energy will be found in the shark which is d um, question 30 which organism in the pyramid function as a tertiary consumer and that will be the same the tertiary consumer in this pyramid would be the shark again and that is option b question number 31 in a food chain involving a primary producer a primary consumer as well as a secondary consumer the sharing of trophic energy is in the form that it's in what form how do you share energy in this kind of uh, food chain secondary consumer gets only a small portion of the energy content in the primary producer just understand this principle that as you move from one level to the other in the food chain the energy reduces they don't share equal energy the highest energy will be at the producer level the least energy will be at the tertiary consumer level so what option is closest to, i mean explains that option d question 32 which of the following is the best sorry is the direct consequence of transferring energy from one trophic level to another so what happened is energy transfer decreases along the trophic level we have said that over and over again and what happened is it leads to reduction in the population size of the organism at the higher trophic level so pyramid of biomass represent the total wet or dry mass of an organism in each trophic level and it takes into account the size and number of individual organisms so here we go which of the following is a direct consequence of transferring energy from one trophic level to another there's a decrease in biomass in the result at least a decrease in resulting biomass all right um question 33 now from question 33 to 40 we'll be considering nutrient cycling in nature and we'll begin we'll be beginning with the um, carbon cycle so question 33 says in spite of the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere its amount remains more or less constant why your guess is as good as mine carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere during respiration combustion decay and volcanic eruption okay so the right answer would be would be b so it's also as you remove it is also being replenished by the process of re respiration and other processes question 34 carbon dioxide 
content of the atmosphere is kept constant. It's kept constant by photosynthesis and combustion, decay, photosynthesis and transpiration. Transpiration is not involved. Respiration and decay. Yes, this is involved. Photosynthesis and combustion, decay, respiration and photosynthesis. The key drivers of carbon dioxide will be photosynthesis, which is a process that takes it away from the atmosphere and combustion, which will be a process that releases it back into the atmosphere. The right answer is C. Now, a question on hydrological cycle or water cycle. If you look at this figure, it says evaporation and transpiration are respectively represented by the component labeled dash. First and foremost, if you look at all of this, one represent evaporation, two represent transpiration, three represent precipitation, four represent surface runoff that's water that moves from the surface back into the ocean right so now one is evaporation here one is here and one is here evaporation from the ground evaporation from the ocean now evaporation and transpiration so one is evaporation and what is two two is transpiration that is from the plant you can see that so the right answer is option a question 35 the main reservoir of water in the same diagram, that's in the circle, the main reservoir of water would be the ocean. That's the main reservoir of um, water. Is it groundwater or the ocean? Okay, let's see. Question 36. The main reservoir would be the ocean. D. Question 37. Water cycle is maintained in nature mainly by evaporation and precipitation, precipitation and condensation, transpiration and evaporation, transpiration and precipitation. So evaporation releases water into the atmosphere, right? Where it condenses in the cloud. Now, what about precipitation? It brings the water back from the atmosphere into the, the ground or the ocean. So evaporation and precipitation would be your answer in that question wow this is moving very fast question number 39 i mean 38 which of the following is readily available to plant in the soil you have gravitational water you have hygroscopic water your capillary water and you have runoff water so i wish i could have time to define all of these types of water but what you know in, in, in capillary water is held in capillary pores of the soil so what that means is that this water can be absorbed by the root of the plant. So it's the most readily available water to plant because they're in the capillary pores of the soil. Gravitational water, hygroscopic, all these other kinds of water, they are not readily available to the plant for use. Now, question on nitrogen cycle. Question 39, it says, during thunderstorm, the energy of lightning discharge caused what oxygen and nitrogen to combine more carbon dioxide to form nitrate to be converted to nitrate nitrate to be converted to nitrogen protect the microorganism in soil yeah so during water during um, thunderstorm nitrogen in the atmosphere combines with oxygen to form nitrogen to oxide with the addition of more oxygen it becomes nitrogen four oxide now this dissolves in water to form um Trouser nitrate 4 acid, that's HNO3. And then this reacts with bases in the soil to form nitrates. So remember that nitrate is the form that nitrogen in the soil can be absorbed by the root of the plant. Okay, so the right answer to this question would be A. Because it begins with this nitrogen and oxygen combining. It, it's a reaction that cannot happen on its own. It needs that thunderstorm, you know, to create that trigger that would then initiate that series of reactions like a chain reaction so but first the the oxygen and the nitrogen needs to combine first they need that thunderstorm and that form nitrogen two oxide then with more oxygen nitrogen four oxide and then that dissolves in water and that form charles nitrate um five acid and then that react with bases in the soil and then it forms nitrate so the right answer would be A. Question 40. 
Question 40. Atmospheric nitrogen is converted to soil nitrogen for plant use by what process? Nitrification and combustion, putrefaction and lightning, lightning and nitrification, combustion and putrefaction. Of course, by lightning, lightning is one that we just explained here, and also by the process of nitrification. What does nitrification mean? Question 41. Is the conversion of nitrate to nitrogen, fixing nitrogen into plant, conversion of nitrate to nitrite, changing ammonia to nitrite, then nitrate, E, nitrogen cycle. Well, nitrification simply means to make nitrogen available, right, in the plant or in the soil. And and how does that happen? You have you need to convert um you need to convert ammonia or ammonium salt into nitrite first by nitrosomonas. Those are in the soil. And then the nitrite will be converted into nitrate by the nitrobacter, which are in the root nodules. So the right answer here would be be option D. So this is the order of the steps. Ammonia to nitrite. This nitrite can be used until it is converted into nitrate. Okay, so ammonia to nitrite will be by the non-symbiotic bacteria, example nitrosomonas, but the conversion of this nitrite into nitrate will be by the symbiotic bacteria in the root nodules, example is the nitrobacter. Question 42. Leguminous plant, mucosa, are usually planted in cultivated farmland. Why do you plant those leguminous plants in cultivated farmland? They have symbiotic nitrogen fixing bacteria in their root nodules, right? And the bacteria fix nitrogen, thereby enriching the soil with nitrogen. So the, the answer would be that they enrich the soil with organic nitrogen. And that is option C. Question 43. Atmospheric nitrogen is directly replenished in nature. By what process? By what process? Atmospheric nitrogen is directly replenished in nature through denitrification, is a process by which soil nitrates are reduced to the atmospheric nitrogen to the action of denitrifying bacteria. So if you look at all other processes that is listed here, the breakdown of ammonia, ammonium salt in the soil, the activity of nitrifying bacteria, the Activities of the nitrify, I mean nitrogen fixing bacteria in root, ingestion, decay, and death. All of these other processes, B to E, they, they fix nitrogen in the soil in one way or the other. But denitrifying bacteria removes nitrogen. Removes nitrogen. So the question actually, I think the, the question originally says atmospheric nitrogen. I, I don't understand this question quite well. What this question is trying to achieve. Mm, I don't understand this question quite right. Okay. Now let's go to question 40, 44. Nitrifying bacteria are important because what do they do? They are important because they oxidize ammonium salt into nitrate. And that is D. 45. Dead plants and animals are decomposed by bacteria and fungi into ammonia. And then the ammonia becomes nitrite and then it becomes nitrate. 46. Nitrifying bacteria, nitrosomonas, convert ammonia into nitrite, which is A. Then the nitrite will be converted into nitrate by nitrobacter. So the answer to this question is A. 47. The condition that encourage denitrification. The condition that encourage denitrification would be low soil oxygen, high soil nitrogen, absence of soil bacteria, lightning and thunderstorm. Of course, if you have high nitrogen in the soil, then most of the nitrogen will have to be taken back into the atmosphere. So that's a very straightforward um answer so most denitrifying bacteria they respire anaerobically okay so 
The nitrate is used by this oxidizing agent in the process and it is reduced to gaseous nitrogen. So when there is high nitrogen in the soil, it's bound to be taken back into the atmosphere. 48, I'll stop on question 50. 48, the nitrifying bacteria, the nitrifying bacteria liberate gaseous nitrogen directly from soil nitrates. And that is option B. One of, the four, one of the ways in which the nitrogen in the atmosphere is converted into nitrates for plants is by the action of, one of the ways in which nitrogen in the atmosphere is converted into nitrate is by what process? One of them is by lightning. Question 50, the most important bacteria that convert nitrogen into nitrate will be what? Azotobacter, and that is option, option, no, let's look at the question again. The most important bacteria that convert nitrogen into nitrate. Oh, sorry, that would be nitrobacter. Nitrobacter. Azotobacter, remember, this is a free um, non symbiotic bacteria that convert ammonia into nitrite. Why ammonia, I mean, nitrite into nitrate will be by the nitrobacter. Okay, so the answer is option A. So that will be the end of the questions. I'll be considering for this section if you think the video was useful please subscribe and share and comment if you think there are questions that the answers were not does not agree with what you know on this note i'll see you in the next video bye bye